the cost of your freedom, the cost of your eternal life is the same for everybody, and it's the cross. It doesn't matter if you come from a high status background or a high income background or if you come from the other side of the tracks. It does not matter when it comes to the gospel. The cost for you is the same, and it's the cross. Paul is writing to the city of Corinth, the church in Corinth, because they have some issues. They have some problems going on. Paul is correcting them and helping them figure out how to worship properly. Um, They have also asked some questions that Paul is addressing. This is one of them. They've had some issues during their uh, communion celebration over the Lord's Supper. And that's what Paul is addressing here in this section of chapter 11. So, That's what we'll be focusing heavily on tonight. Now, part of the struggle here is that Paul is addressing something that, in essence, seems like a pretty good thing. Now, Paul, uh, the church in Corinth, and really the early church in general in the first century after the resurrection, Weekly, they would celebrate the Lord's Supper together. They would take communion every time. That's what they met around. That was their whole, the focus of the gathering. Not only did they do that, but they would actually also do similarly to what we would call in modern times, I guess, a potluck, where everybody just kind of brings a dish and comes together, and they would share a meal together like a big picnic. Uh, It was called, at the time, an agape feast, which sounds much more poetic and eloquent than potluck. But that's what they would do. And the idea was, uh, especially in the Middle Eastern culture or the culture of the first century, you know, a meal, sharing a meal together is still kind of in a, a relational building thing. You know, it's sort of that last step to closer friendship when you've gone out to dinner together or you've had someone over to your house for dinner, it sort of solidifies that the friendship is is a little bit closer, right? You invite someone into your house, you share a meal together. But back then, it really pointed out the intimacy or the relationship that you had. Now, think about it. You're, often, especially back then, you might be dipping your bread into the same same cup, right? You're like, you're sharing together. This is a, an experience that really brings you, the community, together. But this group of people is not necessarily handling that practice very well. Uh, and we're going to see why here. So let's dig in. Uh, verse 17, Paul writes, Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. So Paul starts out, right? First of all, I love that the word of God comes to us from God, but through people. God uses the personality of the author to give us the word in a unique way. And my favorite thing about the Apostle Paul is he feels no need to transition uh, from one subject to another. He just digs right in. He does not care that you... Whether or not you're on the journey with him, he's just telling you what you need to be told. And uh, I can appreciate that. He doesn't need a transitional phrase. He goes right from talking about uh, whether or not head covering should be allowed uh, or part of the worship practice, right to communion. There's no, no middle ground, no transitionary phrase. He just goes right into it. And he says to them, the instructions that he gives them, he, re- he does not praise the city of Corinth, the church in Corinth. He says, the way that they gather is not for the better, it's for the worse. Now, this is a part of the letter. If I was in the city of Corinth, I would be going, I don't really want to hear what Paul has to say, because I'm just going to come out looking bad on the other end of this. Because what he's saying is, when you gather together, when the church gathers together in the city of Corinth, you make things worse. That's rough. 
gathering together to worship the Lord, to celebrate and remember the Lord's Supper, to remember what Jesus did on the cross for each of us and the resurrection, you're making things worse when you gather. That's a rough thing to hear. What does he mean by that? He says uh, in verse 18, for first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. What is he talking about? What he's really talking about is there, there is a difference in social status among different members of the church. And the problem is, in the church, where you should be welcomed and loved, regardless of your social status, because uh, the cost of your freedom, the cost of your eternal life, is the same for everybody, and it's the cross. It doesn't matter if you come from a high-status background or a high-income background, or if you come from the other side of the tracks. It does not matter when it comes to the gospel. The cost for you is the same, and it's the cross. It is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is what gets you into heaven. It does not matter your station in life. It does not matter how much influence you wield or how much popularity you have or how much wealth you have. It does not make you closer to God. But within the church, there has been factions. There have been, they have broken up into social groups based on their status. Uh, and because of this, something has gone awry in taking the elements of the Lord's Supper and in their agape feast. Well, what is it? Let's find out. Picking up in verse 20, Paul writes, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Now, Paul is clearly upset with this group of people for what is happening when they come together to share a meal. And he says, what you're doing is not proper. It is not the Lord's Supper. You're not properly handling communion. You're not doing things right. Because when you come together, what you've done by separating yourselves into factions and social groups based on your own individual status is you've given people the head of the table just based on their standing in the community, not on the fact that they have faith in Christ. And so whether you're a master or a slave, whether you're a high income earner or a blue collar worker, you're a manual laborer or someone who sits in the halls of power, it does not matter. But what is going on is that in this place, in the city of Corinth, because they've broken up into factions, those who are preferred in society are getting first dibs at the table, including the whole dinner, not just the Lord's Supper. And they're taking what they want, meaning by the time it gets to the people who have less, and honestly, when they come to the church, need more, because they don't have enough to get through the week, might not even have the opportunity to have a meal because you're giving food to those who you prefer in society. And it's leaving the poor, the people Jesus told us to take care of, in a place without, within the walls of the church. That is not a healthy place to be, and Paul is upset, which is why he points out to them, I do not praise you. He does not appreciate this behavior. He says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, there's a lot to unpack in this one verse. Now, the first thing is that Paul... The apostle, the greatest evangelist who ever lived, who helped build up the city, the church in the city of Corinth and throughout uh, the Roman Empire, says to them, this is good information for not just anyone who preaches the gospel, but for anyone who's part of the body of Christ, who cares about others coming into it. He says, 
I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Now for Paul, that's a whole lot. Paul's story for us is unique. We find it in the book of Acts. We see that Paul himself was looking to chastise the church, to persecute the church, to even be willing to kill Christians because he couldn't wait for the church to die out. He saw it as a heresy and he couldn't wait to end the church. He held the coats for others with a smile on his face as they threw stones at the deacon Stephen. That's where we meet Paul in the book of Acts, making sure that other people have full range of motion when they chuck stones at a Christian because he can't wait to see him dead. And Paul goes out of his way to get permission from the, from the leaders, both in, in Judaism and Rome, to go seek out the ability to stomp out the church. And with his papers and approval from the governments and the leaders, he goes on his way to crush the church and destroy it. And as he's on his way to Damascus, he sees a blinding light, gets knocked off his horse, and hears the voice of Jesus telling him that he's persecuting Jesus. And Paul is changed forever. When he's later healed of blindness from that light and scales fall off his eyes, he becomes the most powerful tool in the first century for the church to grow. Someone who couldn't wait to end the church growth becomes the biggest reason it did grow. And what he's saying is someone who breathed murderous thoughts to the church now says what I received from God, I give to you. And what he's talking about is the grace of Jesus, the forgiveness, the given eternal life. And everything he's learned from that, he offers to anyone else because he desires to see the kingdom grow and the gospel spread. And that is the attitude that Christians should have. What God has given me, the grace that I have gotten from God, I want to give to the world. I don't want to look out at the world and just point and say, sin, 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 hell, hell, hell. What I want to go is point out to the world and say, I've been there. I needed God's grace. I've been depressed. I've been trapped. I've been addicted. What I needed, God gave me freedom from, and I know the answer, and it's the cross, and you can have what I have. I offer it to you, the grace of God, so that it can be spread in the world. And Paul is saying, that is what I'm giving to you. And then he points out the next phrase, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, as he's talking about them gathering for a meal, which included communion, he points out Jesus the same night in which he was arrested. In the same 24-hour period as the crucifixion, Jesus gave out bread as part of his lesson. And so if the church doesn't feel the moral weight of what Paul is saying yet, I pity them. But he'll continue, and he doesn't hold back. When he had given thanks, speaking of Jesus that night, performing the Last Supper, when he had given thanks, he broke it, the bread, and said, take Eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So when you gather city of Corinth, church of Corinth for the last supper, it's not about you getting your place in line and your place of preference to get a meal and to be sat at the head of the table. What you are gathering together for is to remember what Jesus did for you. That should humble you, not exalt you. And he says, he reminds them of the word of Jesus. This is my body, 
broken for you. Take this and eat and do this in remembrance of me. As the disciples sat there shocked around the Passover meal, wondering what Jesus was talking about, that night Jesus gets arrested and the next day crucified. But interestingly, at the crucifixion, while the other two criminals who were crucified with Jesus had their bones broken to quicken the death so that they could go to burial before sundown, Jesus' bones didn't need to be broken. So what was Jesus saying when he said, this is my body broken for you? He's talking about what happens before the crucifixion. The chastisement. When Pilate was unwilling to crucify Jesus immediately because he understood the innocence and he saw the innocence in Jesus, he tried to appease the crowd by first having him punished and chastised. And he received something that killed other men. He was whipped 39 times with a cat of nine tails. Leather straps with pieces of glass or bone or stone, sharp stone, in them to tear open the flesh, completely broken in his body and his blood poured out. Then Jesus carried his cross to the top of Calvary and sacrificed himself for us. Remember all of that, Jesus says. My body broken for you and my blood poured out for you. If you think it's to have a good meal, if you think you've come here to earn your place of favor in the community or to be the highest status within the building of the church, then you have got it all wrong. It's about worshiping and celebrating the Lord and remembering what he did for you, which should humble everyone in the room. Verse 30, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped, skipped stuff. Verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That's harsh. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And now what is Paul really saying here? He's he's pointing out the, the problem within the church is that there's these elevated statuses of people, and they come to get their meal. They're not really there to humble themselves before God and remember what Jesus did for them. They're offering themselves places of honor in the feast. Come with the right heart. No one, no one on earth is actually worthy to take the bread and the cup. No one. I mean, Paul himself tells us in the book of Romans that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He tells us that the wages of sin is death. No, not one of us has earned a worthy place. But, importantly, he says, let a man examine himself. Humble yourself. Put your heart in the right place before you take communion. Remember what it's about. You know, that's why when we take communion... We often are always at the end of gathering the elements. We take a moment of just silent prayer and examination and take time to repent before we take the elements together. Because you should get your heart in the right space. You're remembering what Jesus did for you because this is honoring him, not us. And so no one is worthy to take the cup, but someone who has a humble heart before God is a person who has received the sacrifice of Christ and the blood of Christ and is in a place to receive the elements because they are aware of the grace that has been bestowed upon them. And so when Jesus gave us this command to take these things and do it in remembrance of him, it was so we don't lose sight of how humble we ought to be before God. 
because we should be fully aware of what he did for us. And that should motivate us to spread the gospel, because if we remember how badly we needed it, rather than how bad the world is, if we remember how badly we needed the grace of God when we were a part of the world, it should motivate us to spread the grace of God rather than to condemn the world who needs the grace of God. And he picks up in verse 30, he says, For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. And so what is he saying? Take that moment of examination to remember that without the blood of Christ, we would be condemned with the world. Take it with a proper heart. And he closes out his statement in chapter 11 with this. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Now, what does that mean? What is he saying? He's saying, when you come together, don't rush to the front of the line because you're in a place of honor. Wait. Wait for everyone. Let everybody have some of the meal. And if you've come with an appetite, but you're more affluent than other members of the church, then eat before you go to church so that you can leave room for those who actually need the meal so that you take less when you're there. Because you should be honoring others rather than yourself. And he says, in the rest I will set in order when I come. So Paul is planning to come to the city of Corinth and straighten them out. And so what does all of this tell us? There's a whole lot in this section. I think first and foremost, it points out that in the kingdom of God, as Jesus stated, the least will be, the last will be first and the first will be last, right? The things we consider honor or status in the world are not the way the kingdom works. And so don't fool yourself. Don't think that you deserve a place of high honor in the church because of your status in the world. Actually, come humbly and put others first. Act like Jesus. You know, Jesus is the one who washed his disciples' feet. He was their master. He washed their feet. Serve others rather than put yourself in a place of honor above them. Secondly, come with a proper heart. Come with proper humility and a heart before the Lord's table. Do not take the elements until you've properly looked inside yourself, examined yourself, and repented. And remembered the grace of God. And lastly, when you look around the room, or you look around the world that you live in, Remember that the cost for their soul was the same as yours. It doesn't matter if you come from a place of lower income or status or higher income or status. You shouldn't look down on anybody or look side-eyed at anyone. All are welcome at the Lord's table because Christ paid the same price for all, regardless of their station in life. And inside the doors of the church and by the church members, that is how all should be treated. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this message uh, that you inspired of Paul. Uh, you know, it's not great that there were these problems in the city of Corinth, but thank you that the problems were rectified or at least addressed by Paul so that they could be recorded for the problems that could exist within the church today. God, I pray that we take the individual action and application of how we treat others and be humble before you and repent and take the Lord's Supper with humility and reverence. I also pray that corporately, as we walk out the doors, that we think very carefully about 
how we look at anyone. Because there's not a person that you look at, regardless of their station in life, that can't be saved by your grace because of the sacrifice of the cross. The cost is the same. And I pray that we look at it that way and are motivated to share God's grace in humility with the world. In Jesus' name, amen.